This is going to be Revelation chapter 22. And we're going to look at heaven versus hell. Revelation 22 and verse 1 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. The first thing I want to point out is heaven has pure water versus hell, which has no water. There's pure water in heaven. There is nothing in the water that can hurt you. It isn't bitter like it is in the book of Revelation as you read about it. Imagine the beauty of the things planted by these rivers of water. Imagine the horrors of hell where there is absolutely no water. Where the rich man lifted up his eyes being in torments and begged for a drop of water on his tongue. If you read Psalms 1, 1 through 3, it said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now notice a connection between water and the word of God. You cleanse your way by taking heed unto the word of God. Amos 8.11 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. Now notice a lack of the word of God is called a famine. And the more you read the Word of God and practice it, the more you will be like the sinlessness or sinless beings in heaven. And the more you neglect the Word of God, the more you will be like the citizens of hell. Uh, heaven has pure water. Hell has no water. There is a famine of the Word of God and a famine of water in hell. And notice in Revelation 22.1, the pure river of water of life proceeds out of the throne of God and the Lamb. And there is nothing more pure than the spotless Son of God. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He is completely pure, no sin, no guilty conscience. He can look you straight in the eye. He's not like you. You're a guilty dog. You hide your cell phone. You hide your laptop. You, you have stuff hidden under your mattress. You have a guilty conscience. You're not pure. And this is why you needed or still need a Savior if you're not saved. He hath became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus Christ became sin for us on the cross and died for all of our sins so that we could become pure and holy and without sin. But this water brings forth beautiful scenery. So this brings us to our next point. Heaven has beautiful sights and sounds and smells. And hell has scary noises and sights of horror. Revelation 22, 2 says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for, for the healing of the nations. Uh, no grove on earth could compare to the trees planted by the rivers of the water of life. And people like to see the palm trees at the beach. And this can't compare to the trees in eternity. Isaiah said the trees of the fields are going to clap their hands one day. And Hollywood has movies with walking, talking, and moving trees. And this can't compare to the trees in eternity. Hollywood just doesn't have an original thought. But the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And all of these people with natural bodies are going to come through to get healing from these trees. Revelation 2.7 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If you're born again, you don't need to get life from a tree. You got it from Jesus Christ. You presently have eternal life. 
Romans 6.23 says, The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, O Lord. So you presently have eternal life if you've accepted the free gift of salvation. But the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Which brings us to our next point. In heaven, you're healed. Versus in hell, where you are eternally dead in sin. Revelation 22.3 says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The curse that has plagued mankind since Adam and Eve will finally be gone. If you are a born-again believer, then you will have already lived without sin for a thousand years. However, the people with natural bodies still have a sin nature. And at this time, the curse will be gone. From man and from the creation, it will not come back and there isn't going to be another incident like what happened in Genesis 3 where Adam and Eve ate the fruit and brought sin to the world. And verse 3 says, The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Imagine a place where you can visibly see God on the throne. Imagine fellowship between God and His people. His servants shall serve Him. And that is the purpose of your life, is to serve God. For His pleasure we are and were created. Serving the lusts of the flesh will no longer be a temptation. Serving the Lord Jesus Christ will be as easy as breathing. And it won't be out of necessity, it will be willingly. Imagine being in your glorified body without the desire to sin. You no longer have a guilty conscience and serving Jesus Christ like you're supposed to is natural because the flesh isn't there to hinder you anymore. And we will go above and beyond to serve Jesus Christ and not just do our duty. As Luke 17.10 says, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. We'll go above and beyond for Jesus Christ just like we should try to do now. But imagine how Adam was able to dress and keep the garden before the fall. He had a job, but it really wasn't work. There wasn't body aches and sweat involved. But with the change from this corruptible and mortal body, we will be able to serve Jesus Christ like he needs to be served. We will be eternally healed. While all those in the lake of fire will get a body like their father, the devil, a red maggot, and they will be eternally dead. And when it comes to their unrighteousness, they stay the same and they don't change. In Revelation 22, if you go down a few verses, it says, In verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now those of us who have been born again will spend eternity without body pain or anything that will hinder us in the work of the Lord. And even those with natural bodies will be healed from the trees. The leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. And it says in verse 14 of Revelation 22, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in, the gate, in through the gates into the city. Some old Baptist preachers didn't think this verse should be in the Bible because they claim it doesn't fit Baptist doctrine. However, you should just rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, nothing in the Bible contradicts itself. You just have to figure out who the verse should be applied to doctrinally. I don't believe Revelation 22.14 is for me in the doctrinal sense. I'm not going to say that I have to eat off of the tree, of, keep the commandments to be able to eat off of a tree to get into the city. I'm going to get into the city because I believed on Jesus Christ and I'm saved eternally. And we don't get eternal life from a tree. We will have glorified bodies at this point and we'll have already received eternal life, the moment of salvation. But there are going to be those who come through the time of Jacob's trouble and the millennium who will have natural bodies and there is commandment keeping involved in them getting to this point of being able to eat off of this tree as the verse says and this gives them the right to the tree of life. And that's just simply what the verse says. You either accept that or reject it or you 
try to make it say something it doesn't say. But moving on, we see heaven versus hell puts you in either the presence of God or wallowing in His wrath. So eternity for you is going to be in the presence of God or wallowing around in the wrath of God. And it's your choice. But in Revelation 22, 4, it says, And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. Remember, all the 144,000 had His name in their foreheads. And we will see His face as well. Not just the people that made it through the tribulation and the millennium, but we're, we're going to be seeing His face for eternity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. You will be looking in the eyes of someone who has eyes like a flame of fire, someone who can see what you're thinking, knows what you did, knows what you've done, and saved you anyway. And you will be seeing the eyes that shed tears and blood to make it possible for you to be there. You will be in the presence of God Himself. However, if you wake up in hell, you will be in the presence of the wrath of God. Deuteronomy 32.22 says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell. And if you go to hell, then you will wallow in the wrath of God for eternity. Uh, John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath life, hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Revelation 22, 5 says, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You will be face to face with light if you go to the right side of eternity. The Bible says God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He is so much light that there will be no night there. You won't need the greater light to rule the day or the lesser right light to rule the night because the glory of God will light the place up. And notice the verse also said, And they shall reign forever and ever. Jesus Christ has saints reigning with Him for all eternity, saints from every age. And if we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. A similarity between heaven and hell is that one of, the, one of these destinations... One of these two destinations is going to meet you shortly. We're all going to go to one of these two destinations, and it's your choice. Revelation 22, 6 says, And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. This was written 2,000 years ago, but notice the phrase, Shortly be done. That reminds me that time is short. Uh, your time is short. If you're 30, you probably only have a little bit more than half of your life left, if that. Think back at how fast the first 30 years of your life have went. Uh, think back to when you were like in 6th grade. It really doesn't seem that long ago. Eternity is too long to be uh, unsure of where you're going when you die. You are going to meet your eternal home shortly. Proverbs 27, 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Time may be shorter for you than you think it is. You could die tomorrow and wake up in hell if you're not saved. The verse said in Revelation 22, 6, These sayings are faithful and true. Everything God said in His book is truth, and you can bet your life on it. If God said hell fire then that means there is hell fire. And Revelation 22, 7 says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Notice that reminder, I come quickly. How many times have you read the phrase, I come quickly, or behold, I come quickly? Even the devil will know he hath but a short time. The Bible says, For what is your life? It is even a vapor. You don't know how much time you have left. And then it says, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And this book tells us of not only a heaven, but also a hell. And one of the things in this book that man doesn't want to keep 
is hellfire. And many people have said to me, God isn't cruel and he would never torture people for eternity. And they obviously don't understand the righteous judgment of God. And they obviously aren't going to keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book if they're going to take hell out. Because the Apostle John tells us about hell in the book of Revelation. If Revelation 22.7 is referring to the Bible in its entirety, then it, the Bible itself says hell over 50 times and you can't, keep, you can't keep the sayings of the book if you don't believe in a literal hell. Revelation 22.8 says, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. I believe John literally saw the millennial kingdom, the great white throne judgment, and what eternity looks like. He was transported in God's time machine and saw the future. Imagine the entire 7,000 years of history from Adam and Eve to the end of, of the millennium and imagine it on a timeline or chart or on a DVD. God can see all the timeline or DVD at once. He can pause it. He can play it. He can fast forward it, rewind it. He can take John from one part of the time frame or the chart and carry him in the future to another part of the time frame. And he can pick John completely up off the chart and put him in eternity in the future to see these things as well. And John witnessed the great white throne and witnessed people being cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. He got a glimpse of the lake of fire. In Revelation 22, 8, John said, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. Uh, John not only heard the things in Revelation 22, but he heard the screams and cries of the people being tossed into the lake of fire. He heard God laugh at their calamity and mock when their fear cometh. He heard the Lord Jesus Christ say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And John got a little carried away in verse 8, and he decides to fall down and worship the angel that showed him some things. And that reminds me of sometimes, especially in the life of a newly saved person, they may start to look up to the preacher they got saved under because he showed them some things that they're excited about. And instead of looking up to the Lord Jesus Christ, they will look up to that preacher more than they do Jesus Christ. But if that preacher isn't an attention-seeking and preeminence-loving person, then he will say what the angel says in Revelation 22.9. He says, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Notice that the angel tells John to worship God and to keep the sayings of the book. And a good pastor or preacher will always point you towards the book, and they will always point you to Jesus Christ and exalt Jesus Christ above themselves. That man would do like this angel did and let you know he ain't no more God than you are. And notice this angel keeps the saying of this book. And I'm glad he has more sense than any Bible corrector. Uh, you see, a Bible corrector may go ahead and let you worship him because he wants to be the final authority. And if you believe these Bible correctors that remove hell from the King James Bible, then you're putting a lot more trust in that man then you're putting in Jesus Christ who said the word hell fire. The Bible correctors will remove the word hell and many other words and verses. But Revelation 22.10 says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And sometimes when God shows someone something, he tells them not to tell anybody. He did this with the Apostle Paul when Paul was caught up to the third heaven. He did this with Daniel in Daniel 12, 9. It says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. And then earlier in Revelation, John was told not to write some things he saw. Some things are to go unknown, but here in Revelation 22, 10, John isn't told to seal the sayings of the prophecy of the book. And then the time is at hand pretty much right around the corner things are getting ready to wind up so whose side are you on what eternal destination are you going to choose 
Revelation 22, 11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Uh, you can go to hell and be the same as you are now. Unrighteous, filthy, unjust. You can get born again and get the righteousness of God and be holy like Jesus Christ because you get His holiness and righteousness imputed to your record. Revelation twenty two twelve says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Isaiah 40 and verse 10 says, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And also notice in verse 12, he once again said, Behold, I come quickly. And it may not seem quick from our perspective at times, but to him it is quick. Because a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And then Revelation twenty two thirteen says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus was here before the beginning. And after the ending, he isn't a begotten God. There was never a time when he didn't exist, and there will never be a time when he ceases to exist. Revelation twenty two sixteen, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring, and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Jesus Christ sends someone to give you a message. Like here, he, ha he sent his angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. And he has done this all through your life. He sent you someone to testify to you with preachers, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And when you get mad at what they say, you're getting mad at the messenger who is only giving you what God gave him to say. That is, if it, he isn't a false teacher. But a true teacher, a preacher, will testify unto you exactly what God said. And if he doesn't have a King James Bible, then he doesn't have what God said. God said... The rich man lifted up his eyes being in torments. And God said hell like 54 times in the book. And anyone who takes out hell any of those times isn't truly testifying unto you what God said. But Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David. And in Romans 1, 3 and 4 it says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So when it comes to the flesh, Jesus Christ was the seed of David. But when it comes to his deity, he's the Son of God. He was born to Mary in the flesh, but he is also fully God and not just fully man. So in the sense of being fully God, he was never born. In Revelation twenty-two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. If you have a new Bible, it will also call Satan morning star in many of them, attributing to Satan something the King James Bible calls Jesus Christ, the bright and morning star. Revelation twenty two seventeen says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth Say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. This shows me that God is a whosoever God. And anyone who wants to be saved can be saved. Anyone who chooses hell goes to hell of his own free will. But you can take the water of life freely. Jesus is that living water. Getting saved is simple. There is simplicity in Christ. If you want to be saved... It is as easy as taking a drink of water. All you have to do is place your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you to be your payment for sin. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the simple gospel. And then Revelation twenty-two eighteen and 19 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things... God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, 
God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. This is a change in doctrine from the Pauline epistles. If, if you've ever seen one before, this is definitely one. Paul teaches that nothing can separate us from the love of God. A saved person who changes the Bible today isn't going to lose his salvation, even though he has added and subtracted from the Word of God. But when it comes to this future time period, in the future, anyone who changes the book will lose their place in the book of life. That's what the verse says. You can, you can accept it or reject it. It isn't that Paul is contradicting John. It's that all the Bible doesn't apply to the same group of people. I'm not going to take this verse and put it on me. If I were to get full of the devil and change what the Bible says, I'm not going to lose my place in the book of life. But somebody will in the future, and that's exactly what the verse says. 2 Timothy 2.15 says to rightly divide. We've got to divide the Bible and figure out who the verse is talking to. Uh, Revelation 22, 18 and 19 obviously isn't speaking doctrinally to somebody in the church age. And Revelation 22, 18 through 19 is just as true as anything Paul wrote. But Paul is the apostle for us today. Paul preaches to us the church. John is preaching in Revelation primarily to saints in the time of Jacob's trouble and the millennium. And this doesn't mean we can't get doctrine from the church age, from Revelation, and also practical things. But you will get in a mess if you try to apply all of it doctrinally to yourself today. So you say, well, how do I know which parts of it apply to me doctrinally and which ones don't? Well, if it contradicts anything Paul says, then you know it's to be applied to someone else. But there are going to be people in hell who took away from the words of the book of this prophecy. And there are many ways you can change the word of God. You can add words, subtract words, and you can take it out of context and you can lessen the severity of it. And I remember when I was younger and I wasn't saved at the time, a man told me that the book of Revelation talks about how a saved person can have his name removed from the Lamb's book of life. And he just had his Bible mixed up. He wasn't rightly dividing. He was trying to apply things in the book of Revelation to the church age as a doctrine. And I don't believe that every person who uses a new version of the Bible or who took part in making a new version is losing their salvation for changing what God said. We are living in a time where we are eternally secure. But then Revelation 22:20 20 says, He which testifieth these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Once again, letting you know His coming is around the corner quicker than you think. Verse 21, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.